Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me uh, speak to you today. Um, I've been tuning the slides over the week and then even last night based on presentations yesterday. So I think what you'll see uh, is some content that relates to almost every one of the topics I've heard about here today. And that's a fundamentally important point, which is that supercomputing uh, provides a foundation for lots of the research that is being conducted in all of these areas. So let me jump right into it. There we go. Um, first, just a few very high level points to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, something that we sometimes take for granted if we've been spending our careers in computational science is that it is still relatively new. Um, it is frequently anointed as the third pillar of scientific research, but we have millennia of experience rolling balls down planes and things like that. Um, we have centuries of theoretical science experience, at least if you want to start it at the point at which the development of calculus and the basis for our underlying laws of nature. But we really only have decades of experience in computational science. So we're really still in the early days, even though some of us in this room have been doing it for most of our careers. Um, I think one thing that we all know, whether we're computational scientists or experimental or theoretical, is that we need computers in some ways in almost all scientific engineering and now medical research problems. The second high level point that I wanted to set out here at the beginning is that computational science is not just modeling and simulation anymore. Modeling and simulation is fundamentally important and as long as the laws of nature correspond to, to mathematical equations, which we expect to always be true, then modeling and simulation will always be fundamentally important in science. Um, there is a complementary mode of computational science emerging, and that is data-enabled science. And there be, you'll hear many phrases for this, be it data-enabled science or data-driven science. The computational techniques are sometimes called data-intensive computing for this data-enabled science. But the fundamental point, and Michael Deem in the video last night expressed this, he's looking for the equations of biology. In many cases, we don't have the fundamental governing equations known yet. But just as computers are getting more powerful, all of our digital devices are getting more powerful. And we have vastly more digital data about the world and the physical processes and biological processes in it than we ever used to have. And it doesn't make sense to throw that data out just because you don't understand the governing equations. And we're beginning to develop a rich methodology of data mining and statistical analysis to try to make inferences from this vast amount of digital data. Um, there's a famous quote by Rutherford about there's physics and everything else is stamp collecting. Uh, in the new era, we know that's not true. The stamp collecting is now collecting vast amounts of digital data from which we can glean some insights and derive information and knowledge from that. Of course, the other view that Wired Magazine had on its cover three years ago is not true either where they called this digital data dec uh, era the, the end of science, and they were sort of trying to be controversial on the cover. Um, the advent of data-enabled science in no way diminishes the importance of modeling and simulation. And in fact, in many ways, the ultimate goal is to, de to develop mathematical models from that data-enabled science. And the final high-level point I wanted to make to start is that big science and big data do require big computing. I didn't say important science, I said big science, and, and much of the big science is important, of course. Um, Large-scale simulation problems require powerful computing, but then you need the associated high-capacity storage and visualization. High-end data-enabled science requires massive storage, but needs the associated processing capabilities. So really, all of this is advanced computing. Sometimes the systems are configured a little bit differently, the policies are a little different, but it is all advanced computing, or more generally, supercomputing. We're now recovering a word that was invented decades ago, and we're now using it to mean all of advanced computing, anything at very large scale. So what is TAC? Well, we're an advanced computing center, or a supercomputing center, if you will, at UT Austin. We provide um, big, fast computing and storage. Th there is big computing in the world. If you go into a Walmart data center, you'll see big computing but it's not fast on individual problems. Supercomputing is really about performance as well as scale. Um, TAC has deep expertise in advanced computing. Taking advantage of these technologies can be the difference between making a discovery and not, but the skills required to use it 
are significantly different skills than developing for workstations. Um, and we enable open science nationwide, but we provide exceptional access and availability within Texas. And when we started this effort 10 years ago, and I had to think about what the name of TAC was going to be, and we were rebooting from prior centers, but starting anew, essentially, and we debated about whether to call ourselves, since we would have some national funding, a, a national center, um, we decided we didn't need to. We wanted to call ourselves the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Um, we would make a national and worldwide reputation in time. We knew then that we would, even though we certainly didn't start with one. But we wanted to make sure that our name always uh, was descriptive of where we are and where some of our priorities are. Um, the TAC mission is to enable discoveries that advance science and society through the application of advanced computing technologies right away that you should get that that covers science, engineering, medicine, and through the addition of and society to our mission statement, really anything else that can take advantage of advanced computing technologies, be they advanced in hardware type, software type, scale, or just usage purpose. Um, some of these slides will be a little dense, and I've tried to highlight just the yellow words, and since we're running behind, I'm going to go through them quickly. Basically, our vision has been to provide the most powerful, capable computing technologies and techniques in the world, to provide leadership in the R&D that goes along with those technologies and techniques, and to enable transformational science by people like you using our technologies and techniques. Now, I said the mission statement when I started TAC 10 years ago. I actually never provided this vision statement for the first few years. Um, I knew what it was, but we had to become credible at that level first. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that now I can share the slide with no laughs, whereas if I'd shared it 10 and a half years ago, there might have been um, some, some skepticism because we started very small. Um, our strategic approach, um, fundamentally, many of you may interact with us solely on resources and services, and that's okay. And there are some of you in this room that are using TAC resources and services now. You may also interact with us in your research and development. So we're talking with some of you and some of your colleagues at your institutions, and in some cases already working with them on collaborative research where we bring technology expertise and infuse it into the domain science research that you do. We also have a number of education and outreach activities. Probably the one most relevant to this audience is that we provide a comprehensive scientific computing curriculum to provide the kind of skills that people really need for computational, not computer science, but computational science and engineering. Um, and we also did that with an eye towards providing those uh, classes for the many health institutions in the state of Texas as well. Um, so, so that's the uh, high level points of the talk and the high level view of TAC. This section can probably be called the, uh, you know, it ain't bragging if it's true section or the, the mine's bigger than your section. Uh, all supercomputing centers have to do a little bit of bragging about this because no matter how much research and development you do in-house, the first thing people ask is, well, how big is your biggest supercomputer? So um, as you can see, even though we've been around for 10 years, and you may not have heard about us until recently, we made our first notable achievement less than 12 months after we rebooted the effort, and that was the deployment of the first uh, power four system in, in the national PACI program, as it was called. That may not seem significant to you now because technologies come and go, but that was the most desired 64-bit open science computing system in the U.S. Um, in some ways, we upstaged our leading edge partner in that project by deploying that and attracted users from around the country to use that resource as early as first quarter of 2002. There are a number of other notable successes on there. I'm going to jump into a few of these real quickly. The system that really made our name such that anyone in the high-end computational science community that hadn't heard of us probably did after this was when the University of Texas at Austin won the grant to deploy Ranger, which debuted in 2007 as the largest open science supercomputing system in the world. Um, National Science Foundation funded this. We worked closely with Sun and AMD on this. We worked with our colleagues in uh, the UT Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences and the UT Computer Science Department, as well as some colleagues from a number of other institutions. At this time, we were absolutely the underdog, and I really enjoyed hearing the chatter about who was going to win this. It's much like the uh, chatter before the, final, the March Madness for college basketball. It always focuses on a handful of teams, and about half the time, somebody rises up and snatches it away, and, and that was definitely us on this one. Um, it's a tremendously powerful system. 
Some of you have used it. Um, it has one more year of life, and I'll talk about what comes after that um, next. Um, a system that others of you are using in the room now is Lone Star. You might be a little confused. This is actually Lone Star 4. Um, the Texas Advanced Computing Center will always have a system called Lone Star. Um, it causes my system administrators a little bit of frustration when they have to overlap by a little bit, and we have multiple systems called this. This was Lone Star 4. We call it that for a few months until uh, beyond the death of Lone Star 3, and then we just drop the number again. Um, this is a wonderful success story. TAC is providing leadership in this system in a couple of ways. One is it's not just high-performance computing. We integrated, in particular because of biomedical researcher requests, large shared memory nodes into a distributed memory system. We integrated remote visualization, or GPU, nodes into this system, and software for high-throughput computing. So many researchers get an account on Lone Star and don't need an account on any other systems. We do believe in the right tool for the right job, but as these tools have been able to leverage x86 microprocessors and Linux operating systems and commodity graphics cards, TAC has taken the lead in integrating different subsystems into a unified system so that researchers have one account and one environment that they have to learn to be productive in the different phases of their computational research. Um, we're also a leader in, in visualization as well. Um, Longhorn is the most powerful interactive remote viz system in the world. Um, it was the result of a different NSF award. Um, the specs are on this slide, but the key point I want to make here is that it provides a tremendous amount of back-end visualization capability, and through optimization of the software and the presence of modern-day networks with relatively low latencies and high bandwidth, we can make it possible for you to do visualization on the workstation in your lab as if you were doing it locally, but on data sets that you could never fit on the workstation in your lab. And, and, and probably we all know the dirty little secret, might not even be able to transfer the data sets over slow networks to your lab. You don't have to. You can use systems like Longhorn now to do that. It feels local, but it leverages back-end power just like our HPC systems. We're very proud of Texas because we like being number one in things, uh, of Stallion, because we like being number one in things in Texas. And this is the highest resolution display environment in the world. It's not the largest in surface area. That might be the thing in Jerry Jones' world, whatever the stadium in Dallas is called. But uh, that's a big screen, but this is much higher resolution. Um, over 300 million pixels. This is important, as many of you know, that have uh, backgrounds in imaging, because we can take very high resolution data about the world around us. In fact, all of us probably have a phone in our pocket that can take a higher resolution photo than any of us can display on our laptop. And we take that for granted, but you're not seeing all the data the second you plug that phone into your laptop and look at the image. This allows us to see the data at extraordinary resolution and scale. We also have some large data hosting systems. Corral started a few years ago, was large at the time, at a petabyte of disk, and the important thing for you to know about this is that we allow you to store many different kinds of data and provide many different data services for you to host that data the way that you want and for you to share that data with your collaborators and, and not with other people if you choose not to. Um, it's grown, um, the usage has grown to over 700 terabytes despite not putting too much attention into it until I'm, I'm about to describe what's coming up. There are about 20 proper data collections on it and then a number of other organized collections. What's really impressive is that uh, as we've announced a new initiative um, that uh, Ken Shine and Patty Hearn are leading for UT System, this is called the UT Research Cyber Infrastructure Project. We're acquiring, acquiring more storage for that system and in anticipation of that storage, which is still in cardboard boxes outside of our machine room, We've had a tremendous amount of people with genome data come to us. In the last quarter alone, 100 terabytes of allocations were made to researchers, um, predominantly at health institutions, but also at universities studying health-related problems um, for this. The, the good news is that Corral is going to grow to over six petabytes here in the next few months, and it'll be a net 25 petabytes by early 2013. There'll be an announcement coming out about this particular change. It's, uh, it's very recent and very positive news. Uh, we'll be working on a press release about that to describe um, uh, what made this possible. Um, the important point here is that we're greatly growing our, 
online high-speed disk storage capability and the ability to store large collections in it, many terabytes uh, in some of the collections even, and we're embedding the processing into it. And of course, for archival purposes, we have the ranch data archival system that has 50 petabytes of uh, ca capacity now, easily upgraded to 100 petabytes. Some very recent news is that we just uh, won a new solicitation for a new open science supercomputing system for the nation. Um, this is about a $50 million package when all is said and done. Um, we did not compete as the underdog. It was, it's interesting how four years can change things. We went from being uh, a tremendous underdog for Ranger to the site that everybody expected to win Stampede. And of course, we didn't want to let everybody down. So uh, we did win Stampede. We're very proud of that. This time, Stampede comes with a renewal option. So it may not even be a one system award. It may be an eight year, two system, $100 million award that cements high performance computing leadership in Texas, which is a tremendous thing. Um, it'll offer 10 petaflops of peak performance, over 200 terabytes of memory, over 14 petabytes of very high speed disk storage. It will have a very high speed, low latency network, um, and it will have integrated shared memory and visualization capabilities building on what we're doing with the Lone Star system that some of you are using right now. So a tremendous new system uh, 12 months from now is coming online, and I really hope to get you excited about it and planning your research now. As Wayne Gretzky said, you don't want to skate to where the puck is, you want to skate to where it's going to be. So I'm, I'm telling you where it's going to be in 12 months, one of the most powerful systems in the world, you'll have superior access to the resource and the talent to help use that resource. Um, this is just some details in the base cluster, so let me uh, move on. The important notes on this, as I said, are we are integrating other capabilities in this so that it can be a comprehensive science environment for you. We don't want you to have to keep moving data around between different special purpose systems. We want you to focus on things like new energy sources, curing cancer, and not so much on the details of which computing system you need to use for which task. I just have one slide on our R&D activities. We do technology R&D in-house. We have over 30 PhDs on our staff and at least 30 other people that are engaged in those R&D activities part-time. Um, but what we do is so that you can do your research in science, engineering, and medicine. Um, sometimes that's collaborative. Sometimes you need new software technologies to enable your domain science research. And we work with people like you on these kinds of things and absolutely want to do more of that. Um, I mentioned our education and outreach activities. We're just about to the point that we can distribute the materials for people on other campuses to teach locally. And we're hopefully by the end of this year to the point where we can just deliver the classes remotely. So if your institution is interested in our scientific computing classes, let me know. I have about 12 slides here to demonstrate the breadth of scientific research um, that we cover, and it doesn't do it justice because we have 1,000 projects running on our various systems. I don't expect you to read all the words. I'm going to give you a one-sentence description of each. I pre-selected these based on things that I'd heard here at the meeting. Um, trust me when I tell you we run from uh, astronomy to biology, chemistry, physics, petroleum engineering, geosystems, even some humanities and socio, uh, social sciences projects now. Um, the energy has been such a theme here that I wanted to start with uh, the most plentiful source in the U.S. of all and also the dirtiest and say that we're, we're helping people with that, in particular people like Jennifer Wilcox, who comes to us as a national user from Stanford University, who is exploring methods to remove mercury, arsenic, and selenium discharge from coal burning. We know we need to move, move away from this, but as I learned from Scott Tinker's uh, nice documentary switch, um, it's not going to be instant, and we need to do things to clean up that use of that fuel source while we move to natural gas and other sources. Um, we all know that we're heavily dependent on oil, and everybody's familiar with the, uh, the oil spill event. Um, we had researchers at the University of Texas, Gordon Wells of the Center for Space Research, and Clint Dawson of the Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences that were using satellite imagery and our supercomputers to model where the oil would go and help in the cleanup efforts. Um, Greg Roden, also of the Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at UT Austin, 
Uh, I thought I'd throw this slide up. This was a last minute addition yesterday after I saw the attention to uh, fracking yesterday in the meeting. I wanted to uh, make sure to let you know that we're doing research into techniques for fracking to try to improve the uh, environmental cleanliness as well as the efficiency of that. Um, Greg Roden is on one of these projects and actually one of our tax staff, Yakub El Camera, is working on a different project in the same area. Um, Jeff Grossman, another one of our national users, is one of the many users using our supercomputing systems to try to design more efficient photovoltaics. We've heard a number of things about solar energy here and how we have to bring the cost down. There are people actively working in the material science area to try to make more e efficient, lower cost photovoltaics, as well as working on the other problems of solar, including storage and transmission. Um, Jerry Krieger from Texas A&M University is using our systems in his wind energy to try to uh, research, to try to understand wind maps and help make good economic decisions on where to place uh, the wind turbines. Greg Beckham at NREL is trying to understand the natural processes that enzymes use and they're very efficient um, uh, uh, energy creators here and so trying to understand the processes they use towards developing more efficient biofuels. Uh, and I think my last energy slide, I'm trying to cover the gamut of what we heard here real quickly. Um, as you just heard in the last talk, one of the issues is efficient uses of energy. Um, there's a project in Austin getting national attention. It's called the Pecan Street Project. And they are instrumenting homes in a new development in Austin uh, at the old airport site. They are instrumenting them to understand the individual usage of power and try to understand how they can develop policies and and that have a social impact, that guides um, people's behavior towards a more efficient usage of power and towards uh, providing it with a better balance on the, on the load and demands. Um, a number of biology projects uh, being supported at the center as well. Klaus Schulten, well-known uh, researcher at the University of Illinois, um, developer of the NAMD Molecular Dynamics Code, which is in use around the world, his team not only develops that code, but they use it actively in their scientific research. He's been a user of TAC for a while. In this particular project, he was trying to understand why the Tamiflu virus was effective for most people, but not with uh, a certain subset of people who had a particular mutation, uh, and how that you could change the Tamiflu vaccine to be effective for them. Um, Lauren Myers at UT Austin, meanwhile, in that same H1N1 flu outbreak, was trying to understand where to put the vaccines Given that there was a limited production capability, where do you pr put them to prevent a uh, widespread pandemic? Um, whoops, I hit the back slide, sorry. Uh, and Chris Gilpin at University of Texas Southwestern doing research to improve the capabilities of electron microscopes um, to try to help people understand the functions of cells and design drugs that are more effective. Um, his own research explored the nature of autism and also uh, new methods for tumor detection. Um, and Tinsley Oden, the director of the Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, was engaged in a project with researchers from MD Anderson as well, and our folks provided some, some support as well using the Lone Star 3 supercomputing system at that time. And I understand there's a new proposal going in for follow-on work in this area. The objective here was to try to do, use um, dynamic uh, data-driven simulations to provide the uh, minimally invasive, uh, effective surgery, in this case, on a canine prostate. Uh, and I think the last bio slide that I chose to include here is one about a project called the iPlant Collaborative. Um, Dan Stanzi, my deputy director, when I recruited him away from Arizona State, said he'd bring co-leadership of this $50 million NSF effort. And I said, well, the 50 million part sounds good. I'm not really that much into plant biology, and he of course reminded me that everything I eat and breathe was produced by plants at some point, and I said, okay, I'm, I'm more interested in that now. Um, it's really got a strong goal towards food production and feeding the world, um, but also on fuel production and drug discovery. Uh, I should say that, that that project is developing cyber infrastructure that is now being repurposed for other computational biology and possibly biomedical efforts. He had some talks with some NIH researchers as, uh, early, as late as earlier this week about them wanting to use the infrastructure they've developed for that plant genome data uh, in their own NIH-funded research. Um, since aerospace engineering was mentioned in the opening session yesterday and the importance of that to Texas and the Houston area, I wanted to close with this applications collaboration project um, being led by the Institute of Computational Engineering and, engineering and Sciences at UT Austin. The project is called PECOS. It's a DOE-funded um, Predictive Science Academic Alliance Program partner. There are only five of these awards in the U.S. 
uh, to five top-notch engineering institutions, uh, significant amount of funding led by Dr. Bob Moser, who's also here at the meeting today. Um, it's a, a lot of the work is about uncertainty quantification and val uh, verification and validation, and hypersonic reentry is the engineering application focus area they're using to study um, uncertainty quantification and VNV. Um, HPC is required in all aspects of the research for this project, and one of our own tech staff is working with the large ISIS team in that. So now we're getting towards the closing here. You know, the, some people sometimes ask me when I give public outreach talks, do, do we really need to invest all of this money in these big singular high performance computing systems? Um, I, I hope I don't have to answer the question for people in this room. There have been a number of federally commissioned reports that talk about the importance of advanced IT, advanced computing technologies, supercomputing, uh, in everything from improving our workforce and our economic competitiveness to national defense and, and, and security towards revolutionizing biomedical research and healthcare. Um, this is generally accepted, of course, in the science and engineering communities. So why does Texas need supercomputing? Well, obviously, there are tremendously important areas of academic research that require big, fast computing storage and visualization. Um, you've seen through the various presentations, uh, the summaries of the O'Donnell Award winners, um, you've seen uh, astronomy and physics discussed, uh, chemistry and material sciences references, geosciences, environment and climate, aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, um, energy in all of re research in all energy forms is dependent on supercomputing. You heard at lunch yesterday how important it was to Shell to build these powerful supercomputing systems. And in fact, most of our industrial partners are oil and gas companies with large supercomputing activities here in the Houston area. Um, life sciences is beginning to embrace computing at larger scales, as is agriculture. Um, and even most recently, we have a handful of uh, economic, social sciences, liberal arts, and humanities projects that are understanding that the very powerful resources we have can enable them to do research that they didn't even think was possible because they hadn't thought about the ways of using computing at all in some cases. Um, more importantly, there are strategic industries in Texas that depend on supercomputing. They're either current heavy users of supercomputing, such as the oil and gas sector, or they're cusp users of supercomputing. Uh, they're, they're beginning to embrace it. Um, oil and gas discovery and production that, that sector of industry is the largest user of supercomputing with aerospace and automotive a close second. Um, water availability and management. Uh, supercomputing is definitely providing tools that are important in understanding uh, the, the research and societal challenges in that area. Uh, I mentioned aerospace engineering, uh, medicine and healthcare. The number of users we have at the health institutions around Texas is growing. And in fact, we had a very large and well attended bring your own code and data workshop on Monday at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and we have one scheduled for MD Anderson uh, next month, I believe. Um, agriculture and, of course, semiconductor design is very big in the Austin area. So what's next? Science has never before had access to anywhere near this scale and variety of data or anywhere near this potential for data reuse and integration. So some things that we'll do at TAC next, and I'm just going to talk about two. One of them is deploy new data-intensive computing systems in 2012 and 2013 that augment and complement existing and planned HPC and visualization systems to support more comprehensive computational science research. And again, I expect we'll have some very big announcements and thanks going out in this area in the next month. Another big growth area for TAC going forward is industry partnerships. We have an industry partnerships program, and these members pay to come talk to our experts and take things back into their companies. Um, but many other sectors outside of oil and gas and the tech sector are ramping up their use of advanced computing resources. Um, so we'll greatly expand our science and technology affiliates for research program or STAR program. You always got to find a way to have a STAR program, right, in a, in a Texas activity. Um, we'll greatly expand that in the year ahead. So our to-do list for 2012 and 2013 has a handful of uh, interesting tasks on it. Deploy one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Grow our data infrastructure into the one of the largest, highest performance data infrastructures in the world. Incre continue to increase our visualization capabilities commensurate with that computing and storage. Expand our biomedical research support in Texas to match the level of support we provide for natural sciences, engineering, and geosciences and grow our industrial program in depth and breadth while retaining focus on Texas companies and Texas strategic interests. So in summary, 
Texas is positioned for leadership in crucial areas of research and industry that have supercomputing context, from energy and environment to medicine and healthcare, engineering and technology. Leadership, however, requires talent and tools. We know that it requires the kind of smart people that are sitting in this room and the kind of people they work with at their home institutions, and they're probably actively recruiting 365 days a year to come to Texas, but those people must have access to the tools to make discoveries. If you have access to better tools and technologies, you have a competitive advantage in, in not only making discoveries, but in pursuing funding for the next round of discoveries and attracting the people that will come to Texas to help make them. We have a world-class center here in Texas, and sometimes you take for granted the things that are in your backyard and assume the national facilities are at faraway places like Oak Ridge National Laboratory or, or uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, I'm here to tell you, if you didn't already know, that we're on that scale now as well, and you have superior access to the resources that we have and to the expertise in using it effectively. So I just want to thank everybody for a tremendous 10 years of success for TAC. Um, many of the people in the room have actually made this possible. Um, people like Juan Sanchez, the Vice President for Research at UT Austin, who brought me to UT and believed me when I told them that we could make a world-class supercomputing center there, and, and Tinsley Oden, the Director of ISIS at UT, who was the one who really gave me the first pitch to coming back to UT where I got my uh, graduate degree. Um, our previous and current presidents at UT Austin have been fantastic in supporting the growth of TAC, as, as has the UT administration. And tremendous thanks also to, to Peter O'Donnell, Carolyn Bacon, uh, Peter Flan, who's also a past president of the University of Texas and also on TAC's board of advisors and an advisor to the O'Donnell Foundation. They really helped us deploy the first large-scale Linux cluster in the world for general open science for a large community. That now seems like uh, run of the mill, but it wasn't in 2003 when we did that. Um, the National Science Foundation has been tremendously supportive and generous to the Texas Advanced Computing Center in UT, as have our technology partners, and the University of Texas System Administration has been supportive, in particular with the UT Research Cyber Infrastructure Project. Um, but I really need to thank the thousands of researchers that use the center and, and help us love our jobs in coming into work each day, as well as the 100 plus staff. Um, I noted right before the meeting that 19 TAMIS members are users of tax resources. Um, that's great. It's not nearly enough. I hope that at your next annual conference, the number is more like 40 or 50. Um, I hope that I've convinced some of you to take the word back to your institutions, that they have access to world-class resources, and they have better access than their competitors. Take advantage of them, use them, and if you want to collaborate with us on things, by all means, contact us, we'd love to hear from you. We'll visit your campus, we'll make presentate, we can make long presentations on any of the individual slides that I, mes uh, that I gave in here. Um, happy to talk to you about anything. So thank you very much for your time and your support. We have time for a couple questions. I'm going to ask Jay to take them with this microphone uh, okay. so we can set up for the next talk. Sounds good. Okay. Yes. Jay, excellent talk. Thank you. And, you know, I'm Richard Tapia. I do computational science. I, I know so you I've are. I've been in this thing for a long time. But here's, here's one thing I want, to, I want to hit you with. Beautiful, wonderful, over the years, we've had science and research centers and, the, and you know, the computing centers take leading roles and do really great things, okay, in terms of outreach, leading the computation, you think. But impacting and changing a content and a culture of traditional computer science departments in this country, we're going away from it, okay? So I see a separation. For example, at Rice, in our computer science department, this is the first year we have no, computer, uh, no computational sciences courses required by the students, and nothing essentially elementary math. So the culture within traditional computer science departments is going away from all the wonderful things that you're talking about. And for example, we used to proudly say mathematics had the record for most underrepresented, underrepresentation in terms of women and minorities. But computer science now wins. Computer science now wins. If you look at the faculty, computer science departments in tier one schools, it's essentially no women and minorities, so you win over math. 
So Jay, how do we fill this gap between the people that are being educated and all the wonderful things that you're doing? Well, I'm glad you didn't ask me a potentially inflammatory or political question, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I, I agree with you completely, and it was implicit in why we're teaching these five scientific computing classes. Mm -hmm. The folks at TAC are on the professional research side of the university. They're not even, they're not, we don't even report under the provost. We're not required to teach, and yet TAC staff recognized in working with researchers that their graduate students were coming to UT with tremendous science and math skills yeah. and limited, to be generous, scientific computing skills. And so, in fact, researchers in ISIS at UT Austin, recognizing what you have observed about computer science departments, asked us to start teaching these classes. We have. It doesn't change computer science department's curricula. It does help us meet the needs of our computational science and engineering faculty and graduate students. The way that that issue is being addressed nationwide, as you know better than me, is one of a number of different ways. In a few universities, they're re-embracing scientific computing. At other universities, they're creating computational science programs and certificates and degrees mm -hmm. and whatnot. At our university, we're doing a little bit of all of the above. We have a new division of statistics and scientific computation. ISIS is a, is a leader in computational engineering and science. The CS program is paying a bit more attention with some of their hires, in, in part because of how ISIS has helped uh, get support for chaired positions um, through people that understand scientific computing. So I, I think what happened in my theory on this, Richard, is that computer science departments, as it went from a service field, uh, field from other departments, mm -hmm. math has always been a discipline and a service for other departments, and computer science was that, a discipline and a service for other departments. I think the progression towards a pure academic discipline and the dot-com era caused massive changes in CS curricula, and they stopped even teaching Fortran and yeah, C. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think we've recovered from the dot com, which then, of course, it's, we don't still have that bubble anymore. And so we're starting to see some CS programs, starting to see some re-embrace scientific computing. But I think we're in the early stages of that. Yeah. I'm going to call it a recovery. Thank you. Yeah.